I understand there are some questions regarding the Trump administration, or, and, but we'll discuss that later on in the discussion. Maybe what, what uh, I'd like to, to, to say as a start for us, as a company, I represent Total, is um, there are, as you mentioned, uh, many uncertainties. We don't know what the, the price of oil is going to be tomorrow. We don't know how electrical vehicles are going to develop. We don't know how people are going to behave in the future in terms of mobility. Actually, there are many things we do not know, that's for sure. And it's difficult for companies like ours to invest for the very long term in oil and gas and in renewable without knowing basics. Okay. At the same time, there is something that we do know. And what we know is that energy demand is going to increase in the future. Energy demand is going to increase because population is increasing, because population from low developed country is going to increase and energy is needed, especially when you get out of poverty. It's true that uh, for people having already three cars, they don't care that much about having a, an additional car. For people having no access to mobility, when they get out of poverty, yes, there is a demand for energy. And our responsibility, at least as a corporate as we see it, is to provide and to supply enough energy to people requesting it. And we have to provide reliable, of course, affordable and clean energy. And the difficulty for us as, as, as corporate is how are we going to supply this energy while at the same time we have to decrease the carbon footprint that energy uh, is going, of course, to have as an impact. And so that's really the combination. And I would like in the discussion, in my view, to discuss there are four elements that seem very important for us uh, in order to be in a position to have this kind of paradox to supply energy while decreasing the footprint. And I would say the first one is we need to get organized, meaning we, get, we need to get prepared in order actually to, to, to do that. Then we need to take actions, meaning we need to make decisions. And I will give some examples, for instance, company like ours decided to get out of the coal business. And Olivier mentioned, what about coal? Well, there are some decisions that you have to make. And of course, it's easier maybe for us than for uh, some countries. But it's interesting to see what are really the levers. Thirdly, I think we need to advocate. We need to take positions on CO2 pricing, on CCUS, on, on different things in order to make things happen. And at the end, we need to report. We need to be transparent. We need to explain what we're doing because companies like ours in the oil and gas business, we, uh, people are going to say, okay, we cannot trust you really because, you know, you are, how can we? And so if we don't report, if we don't explain, if we are not transparent, it will not work. So that's the four levers I'd like to come back to. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Radislas. Yeah, I fully agree with that, your final point that um, kind of transparency or to the market, the message is very important. Everywhere now, the ESG environment, uh, soci social and corporate governance investment is happening. So they are, they are certainly uh, ranking the companies of their efforts by many <coughs> indexes. So without clear, uh, you would say, messages and transparency, policies of the company, the report really, I mean, the financial sector cannot really evaluate properly of what corporations doing. So that that is interesting point. Uh, and especially for the total, I think you have the carbon, internal carbon pricing, right? At certain level. Yes, you're, you're, you're right to mention that. Internally, even though uh, the uh, carbon pricing system in Europe, at least, is not working very fine, uh, you know that uh, we are at, I don't know, maybe five, seven uh, euros per ton of CO2 in the ETS system, we consider that first we advocate for a carbon price, actually, at the level of 20 euros per ton to apply in order also to create business models. Mm -hmm. And already since quite some years, we have 
in all the decisions we make, mm -hmm. in the projects that we sanction, we take into account a carbon price between 30 and 40 dollars per ton, depending mm -hmm. on the assumption that we have for the oil price itself. Mm -hmm. And we have that included, embedded in our analysis, economic analysis, so that we can rank projects one against the other and make decisions assuming that over the long run we'll have a carbon price, mm. even though we don't have one today. Yeah. That, that is very interesting um, point that uh, uh, maybe one of the conclusion which I want to draw is the need for the internal carbon pricing for any big, well, s even small corporations to make um, financial sector has enough kind of impact to make a difference. Uh, you know, uh, global communities in climate mitigation failed, unfortunately, more than decades of creating carbon pricing mechanism as such, or carbon taxation, because uh, harmonization of these systems is very diff difficult. Yes, European experiment of ETS is, is very interesting one, but still it's not really working. So the corporate decision of making that kind of internal pricing is probably a more pragmatic way to make the difference. That is my view. But anyway, unfortunately, in Japan, well, we could ask Masuda-san, but uh, there's almost no company with internal carbon pricing. I found recently only one, Impex, started internal carbon pricing. But otherwise, there's none. So, you know, we, I mean, Japan is lagged behind in, in this exercise.